Okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. <clears throat> and I'm going to be going over the 11-game uh, main slate that we have here on Friday. Um, probably not going to touch on the turbo slate. We've got three uh, starting at, whatever, 6.30, 6.40 Eastern or something. Um, interesting little short gamer there if you, uh, you want to punt. Um, but we'll not be going over that. And we also are missing one of the uh, missing the afternoon game with the Cubs, and uh, I forget even who they're playing. Um, Miami. So that keeps us down to uh, about eleven games here tonight, and we got a, a lot of different arms here, uh, a lot of guys that are in the early projections. <laughs> Up, up top here, really everybody from about the 8K range all the way up projecting in the, in the same sort of fantasy point range here, starting with Freed down here at the bottom. He's going to be the most popular, and in those scenarios, that's kind of what you'd expect. The cheapest guy, if everybody's projecting mostly the same, he should probably be the most popular, and that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, but pretty spread out for the most part up top here in very early ownership runs. Um, so I think we're going to have to really get into into the weeds a little bit when you're building teams and make some pretty granular decisions on some of these guys. And I think we can do that. Um, down in the in the lower range, there it kind of looks pretty gross on first blush. And certainly if we're just looking at the projections, we're not all that thrilled with a bunch of red numbers down here. We do like green numbers in the ownership but um, we'll have to keep an eye on how all of this stuff changes uh, throughout the day. And even here in the last couple hours, these ownership numbers have fluctuated a lot. So um, early numbers on Freed, for example, were at about 26, 28 percent. That's come up 10 percent in the last couple hours. So um, as more data comes in from the rest of the industry, these numbers will get updated. We have pushed them to the site. You'll probably see something different than you do here in the sheet, but uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot of games here. So let's just get into it and and talk about who we can play on the mound uh, and who maybe we can stack against them. So uh, first game up here, Boston at Philly. Interesting matchup here, and we're going to get a lot of these this year with, with everybody playing everybody. Um, and we have Chris Sale going for the Sox, who's been a little bit better. He's... He's still eh, kind of up and down. It, it's really just been every other start for sale that's been good. And in between those good starts, uh, he has had some real clunkers. So um, unfortunately for our prospects of playing sale at a decent price tag, you know, 7,500 is fine. Um, his last start was really good. So <laughs> if uh, his first six starts are any indication of future results, he's likely to get picked apart here by the Phillies. Um, this is a bad matchup for him, of course. I mean, they've been striking out a little bit here in the early going against lefties. 24%, about a tick above average or so. Not creating, of course, just yet, but they have just gotten Bryce Harper back. And when he gets going, uh, he's going to make this lineup really tick here. Um Certainly, as we get into the summer months, when when you know, the weather starts heating up in, in Philly in particular, um, Schwarber, Turner, Castellanos, JTR, all of these guys are really going to kind of come into their stride. This lineup has been pretty underwhelming so far this season, but now that they've got Harper back, he's going to really uh, solidify everything there. And... They're going to be even more dangerous than they have been and, and even more difficult to go after. Uh, we've been able to target them a little bit with some high swing and miss guys. And Sale is that. He does have some K stuff still. Um, but as we mentioned, there's the variance still with Sale. And uh, it's contact mostly because he's got a bad fastball mix here. Um, the the changeup he's been able to survive and establish with a little bit and kind of calm down this negative fastball value. but Four-seamer sinker usage at um, 
you know, call it an average negative one and a half outs above um, relative to league average is, uh, is really not good. So you're still going to have to establish with fastballs in order to put yourself in equitable spots. And with just a marginal breaking pitch here, league average slider, um, it's still going to be, there's going to be a lot of variance still with him. So naturally that, that really makes sense that we've seen a lot of that uh, in his results uh, over his last several starts. But the K stuff is there. The swinging strike stuff is there. CSW still pushing 30%, and that's encouraging. Um, the walks really haven't been a problem. I mean, of course, in the early going when he was getting back into it, maybe some adrenaline or something, um, you know, was causing that him to kind of spray it in his first couple outings. But um, it's it's really just kind of contact that we're a little bit concerned with. It's it's putting it's getting behind in counts really, and then pitching to a little bit too much contact when he tries to make up those um, make up those deficits. So it's 36% on a barrel to the righties and 33% in a very short sample over here against lefties. So we don't, I mean, it's almost not even worth mentioning. So we won't mention it. But to the righties is a much bigger sample. 29 innings, 134 hitters, 269 average. That's that's elevated, and that's a pretty big number. 337 WOBA is as well, 168 ISO. So despite a 25% K rate and a low walk rate, a flatter ground ball to fly ball ratio here with a huge, huge line drive rate, 30% line drive rate here in the early going, and barrel contact at, at 36%. No soft contact induced really to either side of the plate at, at just 13.5%. So that's very worrisome and why I would almost definitely side with Philly. Despite a, an attractive 7,500 price tag, this ownership at 22%, I think this is too high um, at this moment because we've got some other guys, not so much in the mid-range that were all that jacked about playing. And certainly not a lot of guys have the same k upside that sale does in this in this particular matchup with the phillies getting harper back uh, i'm not really excited about that i don't like this hard contact i don't like the lack of soft contact um induced here and this huge line drive rate is super worrisome in the early going i think it uh if he is not establishing here early in counts with the um uh, fastballs it's going to make him really susceptible to some right-handed power here and getting the baseball in the air. And this is a small ballpark over here in Philly. So um, I would side with Philly here. And problem is their pricing makes it a little meh. Uh, 5,600 for Trey is fine. Harper at 56 is, is fine too. Castellanos 47, eh, a little high um, in this particular matchup, but it's, it's fine. 48 for JTR, also not super thrilling. Alec Bohm at 39 makes it a little better. And Edmundo Sosa down at the bottom of the list, who's been great against left-handed pitching this season, 2,500 for him. So you can make this happen. I would probably stay off of Kyle Schwarber. Not great against lefties as it is. And 54 is an elevated price tag. But, um, you know, you can make some Philly stacks happen if you want to target a very high line drive rate and some susceptibility for Chris Sale. If you want to just play that sort of... Uh, trending pattern of good start bad start for sale as i mentioned his last start was pretty damn good so um you know that's not really something we want to target with any regularity necessarily but uh you know if uh, if it continues then it's kind of something we can't ignore so um that said the the early metrics here on sale at least in terms of th throwing strikes and and getting it over the plate are very encouraging uh, we're, we're getting back into the Chris Sale range. Um, and if this stuff continues, then at least in terms of throwing strikes, then the 7,500 is going to be probably, uh, you know, not long for us. You know, we're not going to be able to acquire some sale pieces at 7,500 for too much longer. But um, the hard contact and the high line drive rate to righties, that's got both of these numbers have to come down for me to get all that encouraged. And I don't like the ownership so far. So, so give me some of the Phillies. On the other side, Zach Wheeler, 10-6. I'm also not crazy about this kind of price tag here. Um, there's plenty of other 10K guys that we could get to, and this is kind of a difficult spot for Wheeler, even though his last two outings have been fantastic. One of them was against the Rockies. Uh, we couldn't play him. It was a showdown slate. 
Went six, struck out 11. Still walked three guys, though. Command has been a little bit of an issue for him. Three walks in, in three of his, what, six starts this year. Um, not terribly worrisome overall for Wheeler because his control is, is mostly just fantastic. Um, but battling it, battling the command here a, a little early in the season, uh, he fixed that in his start against Houston in his last outing. Just walked one, struck out seven and six innings. So he's going deeper into games now. This is more the Wheeler that we know and that we were kind of expecting. We weren't really worried about him. It's just early season Zach Wheeler is kind of tilting. Um, excellent fastball mix here with the four-seamer sinker, and this allows him to kind of get away with subpar breaking stuff. Really a league average slider and a bad curveball. Doesn't throw an off-speed pitch with any regularity, really. So it's mostly just four-seamer sinker slider curve. That keeps him down in the strike zone, and and that's usually where we want to be, especially with guys that have high K stuff. Now, he's a little bit more susceptible to left-handers, and that's really Boston's strength here, of course. Um, against righties this season, 123 WRC+, plus with an 18.5% K rate, 202 ISO, 33%, 32% hard contact rate, and a 360 WOBA, hitting for a full 280 average. So... At an elevated price tag here at 10.6, I think I'd probably rather get to Kershaw later at 10.8 uh, if I had to choose in what's an equally bad matchup. Um, but I like the ownership here on Wheeler, and it's going to keep the, the... I mean, this number is going to stay down because we've got so many arms that we could play today. So um, I think this is okay, and we can get to probably 1 in 8, 1 in 6 teams Um here with Zach Wheeler. I think this is fine at 10-6. I'm not overly thrilled about going after Boston, though. But I also don't really want to stack against Wheeler. Um, if anything, like it would be like some line drive hitters, uh, which would be like a Rafi Devers. 5700 though, you really want to pay a full price on, on Rafi Devers going after Wheeler. I'm not super thrilled about it. Same with a Verdugo or a Yoshida. They're, they're seeing the baseball well over here. Darren Duran, price adjusted, probably the best play at 3600 in the middle of the lineup. But uh, he's probably going to strike out a, a pretty good bit here. Still a young hitter. He's figuring it out a little bit as Duran, but um, still some susceptibility. You can see the growth at the plate in his plate discipline, but he's still going to strike out a lot in this particular spot. So um, I'm not overly thrilled about playing Boston, but uh, really just the price tag, I think, here in lineup construction is going to keep me off a lot of Zach Wheeler. I do like the ownership, though, and we're rounding into Zach Wheeler sort of form here, so I think it's a fine play. Uh, okay, let's get to Colorado on the Mets. Um, we're getting Antonio Sensatella back which is nice for the Rockies' rotation. They're getting banged up a little bit. Kyle Freeland had to come out of his start with a sort of little stinger in his neck. Um, we talked about Herman Marquez, who has to have TJ. Noah Davis is down with elbow inflammation. So they're getting Senza back. It hasn't been an arm problem for him. He tore his ACL last year. Um, that's not to say that you know, we would consider playing Senza anyway, uh, even at 5,000 here. Like, this is an attractive price tag. He has 15, 18 points in him as a raw ceiling, but not in this matchup. This is a horrible matchup for him, even though the Mets have been terrible over the last... They just got swept by the Tigers. Um, he doesn't have any K stuff. He just doesn't miss bats, and he's on the barrel at a huge, huge rate here, 40% hard contact last season to the right side with a 182 ISO, uh, 180 ground ball to fly ball, so that neutralizes a little bit of the production in terms of you know run suppression that uh, he would otherwise give up if this number were lower. But 40% uh, hard contact, like there's kind of a, a threshold above which we just like throw out the well, I don't really care about hard contact when the ball's on the ground sort of um, conversation. And we're just like, what, well, 40% hard contact, 40%. And you can't really, like, you can't ignore this. So um, this plays it plays into the Mets pretty well here. Very, very high line drive rates against Senza. 26% to both sides of the plate. And the Mets aren't really going to hit the ball over the wall necessarily a lot uh, outside of you know, a Pete Alonzo or a 
uh, Frankie Lindor on occasion. Just a 137 aggregate ISO, but they're going to hit the baseball on the line, slightly elevated as a team here at 21.5%. It's a good number considering that they do hit a lot of ground balls relative to fly balls. So um, they're going to be on the ground and in the uh, on a line a little bit more. So I think this plays into their batted ball profile here against Senza. And, of course, he's not going to strike anybody out. 13% aggregate K rate, 7% swinging strike rate, one of the lowest rates in baseball for a starting pitcher. He has excellent control, however, despite a sub-60% strike one rate. He still throws it over the plate. The problem is it's a lot of contact here, 85%. So when we're talking hard contact to righties, high line drive rate, mid 20%, and a lot of contact itself at 85%, I mean, this is a bad recipe. So we can go after Senza for sure uh, and look for the Mets to bounce a little bit. But don't be surprised if at 5,000 he survives here for five innings or so. Um, his couple of rehab starts in the minors have been pretty bad, but like you can't really take a lot out a lot out of that because he pitches to so much contact, and those rehab starts are playing for Albuquerque in the PCL. So, um, you know, a lot of offense in that league. In any case, we can go after Senza definitely. I'm not wild about the pricing here, however. Um, Starling Marte, it's a little bit of an upside spot for him at 4,800. It's okay. 49 for Frankie and Pete Alonzo back up to 58. Those guys got price bumps. Brandon Nimmo, Jeff McNeil make it a little bit cheaper. Danny Vogelbach, I like this spot for him. High line drive rate allowed, as we talked about, and Vogelbach's going to be able to get the ball in the air. So if we're hunting for a homer or something, he'd probably be the pick. Um, but this hard contact rate against righties is very worrisome. So you can get to Petey and Starling Marte as well. Brett Beatty, Luis Guillorme down at the bottom of the list. They'll make it a little bit cheaper for you. Tomas Nito will probably be back in the lineup here today for the Mets. So plenty of ways to round out stacks if you choose to get there. No sends on the mound for me, I don't think. Could I sang on the mound for the Mets? Man, I really want this to be good and playable, and sure, it's 10-2, and he's got a 27% aggregate K rate, and he gets the Rockies, who are striking out at a 24% clip so far against righties this season with an 82 WRC+, plus and a 140 ISO. This is a pretty pathetic offense, and they're not in Coors Field anymore, so it's going to play down their offense now that they're at a pitcher's ballpark. However, could I say a has a 15% walk rate in five starts this year. I mean, this is out of control bad. He cannot throw the slider or the splitter for a strike. And not that the splitter is necessarily a, a pitch you want to throw for a strike, but the slider kind of is. Uh, you need to be able to get chase on these two pitches. And here you go. You got a 23% chase rate. It's because the, the pitches out of the hand are just not competitive. They're balls out of the hand. And that makes it very easy for guys to just take walks and sure enough 15 percent walk rate even though he's throwing strike one early in the count he's establishing sure with the four seamer in the cutter early in the count but afterward like he this is horrible horrible value because he's walking this many people um goes really deep into counts and with this kind of case stuff that's not very encouraging when we're paying 10-2 for a guy even though they get the rockies outside of course field so there's a lot more variance. I think the, a couple of the other guys, I'd rather get to like a Zach Wheeler, I think, uh, even though the matchup is markedly better. And that's not to say that, you know, if this ownership number keeps dropping, as it has here in the early going this morning, I mean, we're under 10% now. And I think you can take some, you know, 10, 10% could I sang it teams here. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, Rockies are still bad and he's still a good arm here. But th this is like pretty worrisome if he's only going to go five and a third he has upside for like a max of six innings we're still paying 10 for 10k for the guy and this is an 11 game slate there are plenty of other guys that we can get to i don't think this is a must play necessarily um because this is super worrisome 36 percent hard contact in aggregate so far on the barrel a little bit giving up some power short sample yeah but giving up power and walking a lot of guys here. And even against the Rockies, it's still a big league, big league lineup. And they're going to be able to pick you apart if you cannot throw strikes and you put people on base for free. So I, I say this every day. And, um, you know, Kadai Senga, he's got to figure this out. Otherwise, I mean, we're, we're just not going to be paying 10K for him. I'll tell you that much. He'll, he'll be a, a 7 or an 8K pitcher. 
um, kind of in like Chris Sale territory, right, where he's got swing strike stuff, but some vulnerabilities. So not super thrilled about playing this, to be honest. You can play some correlated stacks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because this is Rockies and they're bad, but um, probably rather get to some other guys. I don't like paying above 10K for a guy that's probably only going to go five innings as a huge, huge walk rate. Not super interested. Okay, Minnesota and Cleveland. Uh, Bailey over on the mound for the Twins. We really like Bailey over against right-handed heavy lineups, and the Cleveland Guardians are not that. They are going to platoon very heavily here. They'll probably have, I would say, at least six lefties in the lineup. Um, and none of them strike out. So this is not a good spot for Bailey over. He has a 16% K rate over the last season plus against lefties. And that's really not a, a good recipe here. Mega fly baller. So we don't really want to stack against guys like this that are this heavy in the fly ball category. Similar to, to Joe Ryan um, with an 050 ground ball to fly ball. Very difficult to stack against these guys because they're... Their MO is getting fly balls and soft ground or soft fly balls. Kind of a lot of pop ups and things like that. And when there's not a lot of hard contact to opposite handed hitters, it makes it difficult to mix in full stacks of them. However, we can get to him with some righties here, despite a twenty eight percent K rate here. He's got a forty percent hard contact rate himself, similar to Senza. Like this is an astronomically high number and with a lot of fly balls, 070 ground ball to fly ball, it's actually a little bit easier to attack than a, certainly an 033 ground ball to fly ball um, when there's this much hard contact, right? So I mentioned the kind of threshold where we just kind of we throw out the, the batted ball numbers and just be like, okay, this is hard contact pushing 40 and 50%. I don't really care. We're just going to play the guy for stack against the guy. And we might be able to get into that, ta that territory here with Cleveland. However... I mean, Cleveland is just dreadful. Um, 106 ISO, 287 Woba, 26% hard contact in aggregate themselves. No soft, really, but most of it's just medium, and they just kind of pop everything up and uh, roll everything over. Buck 30, ground ball to fly ball. Nothing really to speak of on a line. Yeah, sure, it's north of 20%, but, like, whatever. 10% walk rate and 20% K rate is going to make them still difficult to go after. But... Um, so at 7,200, I think the price tag would be fine, but this is a bad, bad strikeout matchup for him. And I don't really want to attack Cleveland in general, even though this offense is just really, really poor. I'd rather he were, if he were like 6,600, I'd be pretty excited about that, I think. Um, but probably not in this particular matchup. It's just really hard to target Cleveland for strikeouts with a, a low strikeout. Uh, platoon split here. Peyton Battenfield on the mound for Cleveland. Same thing for him. Very low K matchup uh, as well against the Twins. Now, they'll strike out against righties, but he doesn't have any K stuff really to either side of the plate. 12% walk or um, K rate to lefties. He has some a little bit more K stuff against righties, but this is a very short sample here so far. He's only got four starts, and he actually was pushed to the bullpen and in or four games he's got three starts he was pushed to the bullpen in one of these games because of the excess of arms it, that Cleveland has but they just sent Zach Plezak down to the minors as a matter of fact so he's going to get a, another spot start here probably not long for more than I don't know five innings if he even makes it that far a lot of contact here as well very low swinging strike stuff high walk rate and no strike one so we can attack this as well um, even with a, a super short sample, like 65% hard contact over 34 hitters to the left side, uh, that's, that's pretty alarming, even in a short sample, 48% to righties. So not a lot of hitters here in a very short sample, certainly noisy. All this stuff is going to come down, but that doesn't necessarily mean in this particular matchup that it's going to come down, you know, to zero, like immediately, right? Uh, the Twins over here still creating at an average clip, 104 WRC+, plus, hitting for some power, 176 ISO. You can play some of the Twins here, I think. 37 for Kepler is fine. 45 for Correa, it's a little bit better now. 53 for Buxton, also a little bit better. 47 for Polanco, still kind of high, but it, it's fine now. I think this is a high upside contact spot for him. And Trevor Larnick should be back in the list today at 3,400. Josie Miranda, Joey Gallo, I think you could probably consider playing today, even though he's at an unplayable price tag. 
with a 40% strikeout rate at 4,400 for him, it's probably okay because Battenfield really not going to strike him out all that often, even though Joey Gallo is probably going to strike out a hell of a lot more than either you or I would in this particular matchup. So um, you can play uh, some some twins here. I think they're just kind of a, a middling sort of value and uh, ownership stack here. And I think they're off the board. There's some other teams that will probably want to get to ahead of them, but uh, I think you can get to them on a full 11 gamer here and target some contact in this game. You could probably do it. You could consider game stacking here, but you know, get pretty frustrated once again when Cleveland doesn't hit for any extra bases whatsoever. Uh, so really, only the Twins here, I think, and really not super enthused about any pitching. Okay, Baltimore and Atlanta. Dean Kramer on the mound. We're not we're not playing this against Atlanta. Uh, 6,300. It, it's an okay price for Dean because he's got a decent fastball mix. He can survive, but he doesn't throw it past anybody. The changeup and curveball mix, I guess, with a little bit of the slider as well, uh, it's all really really negative value for him. So he's just a fastball guy, and that that's not a recipe that we want to um, be involving ourselves with against Atlanta. We saw even yesterday against Jesus Luzardo, they still got to him, and he's got the highest swinging stroke, one of the higher swinging strike rates of any starter pitcher in baseball, pushing 14%. So um, Dean Kramer is down here four ticks lower than that, sub 10%. 25% CSW, so no thank you against the Braves at 6,300. I, I just can't do it. Um, we're going to want to get to some of these lefties here, I think, for sure. For sure, because of the really bad changeup over here, and that's Matt Olson and uh, Eddie Rosario territory. You could place Michael Harris as well. He's a good price, 3600. Dealing with uh, a little bit of a nagging, I think a back or a knee or something, um, but should be healthy. I think he should be fine. Uh, Ozzy from the left side is okay at 4600 as well. I have to keep an eye on Acuna. He fouled the ball off his knee yesterday. Had to come out of the game. Because he was limping pretty good. 6,600. Well, we got to kind of keep in mind here that while this is Acuna, and if he's in the lineup, yeah, just roll with him. If he's got a bum knee, it might decrease his overall stolen base upside, which is really why we want to be playing Acuna. He's not really hitting the ball over the wall a whole hell of a lot this year. Hitting more ground balls than he has in the past. Not that that's worrisome or anything, but... At 6,600, these are the kinds of things we have to pay attention to You know, when we're paying that much for a hitter. If his stolen base upside is decreased even a little bit, uh, that's a pretty significant downgrade. However, this is still the Braves, and this is still Dean Kramer, and it's still Acuna. I don't particularly care. He's got enough in the swing that he can just hit the ball over the wall and jog around the bases, so we don't really care. Um uh, so we can stack them. They're at play, more playable price tags now than they have been in, in the last couple of weeks, I suppose. But uh, 54 for Olsen. He's going to be pretty popular today, I think, as will pretty much everybody here. Certainly Eddie at 2,700 in the middle of the lineup. Pretty good play there. So uh, I think we can go after some Dean Kramer here. Um, we're probably not going to want to go after Max Fried on the mound. 8,200 for him pushing 40% ownership, I think this number is probably getting a little carried away. Now, I love Max Freed. Um, not to say we don't want to play him, and not to say that we want to stack against him, but 40% ownership here when on a full 11-game slate, we're kind of getting a little carried away. I love Freed, and I love the arsenal. Every pitch here is fantastic. The control is elite. There, there isn't a, a single worrisome... Uh, batted ball figure or anything like this. It's it's all excellent. So in that regard, yeah, he's underpriced at 8,200 really for any matchup. So he has upside to pop through that. But at 40% ownership, I mean, should he be in four of every 10 teams that we build, given how many arms that we will get to that we could probably consider? I mean, I don't know. Seems a little high. He's going to be, he's definitely the chalk SP2 if you want to consider him an SP2. Um, so that's really the only thing that would keep me off here. And also, I don't really generally like going after Baltimore. I respect this lineup over here. 19% K rate, 11.5% walk rate. They're not going to walk. 
in this matchup here, but uh, 128 WRC, WRC plus and a 185 ISO, 355 Woba. Like this is a good baseball team over here. Good lineup that can really platoon and make things a little bit more difficult on Freed. And if anything, if anything, it's the lower strikeout rate, about a tick below average to the right side of the plate, 22% versus 26.5 to lefties so we don't want any lefties over here because they have a two and a half ground ball to fly ball and a huge k rate 165 ground ball to fly ball a little more attackable there with righties against freed and a lower strikeout rate as i mentioned but the hard contact rate is sub 24 percent to righties soft contact is north of 20 percent at pushing 21 so um we don't really want to deal with this line drive rates are great so, I mean, he keeps the ball on the ground. He has K stuff, and he has five excellent pitches here. So I, I like free, definitely. It's just the ownership game that we're going to have to play here in what's kind of a difficult matchup here uh, against Baltimore. They've hit lefties very well here in the early going. 450 PA is nothing to sneeze at. So um, 128 WRC+, plus. that's a big number. Now, do we want to stack against him? As I mentioned, no. 55 for Rutch, no thank you. 48 for Mountcastle in a, in a down matchup. No, thank you. Santander is okay. He's good from the right side at 45. Georgie Mateo is 53 now. At least he's in the five hole. That's more playable. Uh, James McCann, who I believe I called Brian McCann yesterday. Uh, no relation. 2,800 for McCann behind the plate. I think that's playable. So if you do want to get to like a three-man or something with an Austin Hayes, that's a little bit cheaper. Hayes, Santander, Georgie, um, excuse me, James McCann behind the plate. I think that's all right. Everybody else, though, I mean, they're pretty expensive for this particular matchup. So um, very low total against Freed here, naturally, because the stuff is excellent. Um, and Baltimore's cooled down a little bit, even though they put up a 20 spot against the Royals yesterday. The Royals are the Royals. So yeah, this, it's all right. Uh, it's just the ownership number that's going to keep me down. It's going to be hard if you're just building teams to avoid this 19.5 median projection. But admittedly, 19.5 is a median outcome in this particular spot. Might seem a little bit high. So we could be getting a, a bit carried away there. Um, so that's really all we got to be careful of. But fundamentally, it's a fine, it's a fine spot to attack. Okay, Oakland and Kansas City. Kyle Muller on the mound for the A's, who has been awful. Um... And Brad Keller for the Royals, who has also really been awful. We'll get to him in a sec. 5,200 for Moeller. I'm not, I'm not doing this. He has a 16% strikeout rate. And you're going to see a lot of chalk on Kansas City today, I think. Um, they really kind of started heating up a little bit over the weekend. We talked about warm weather plays up scoring in the, in the ballpark over there in at Kauffman. Um, and really nothing is going to change today. It's, it's warmish again, 70, 75 degrees, somewhere around there. And we're kind of getting into scoring territory um, over here for even a bunch of bad teams, and the Royals certainly qualify there. Both of these guys on the mound here, Muller and Keller, they've had, well, they don't strike anybody out, number one, and they've really had trouble throwing a lot of strikes. 11, 12% walk rate for Kyle Muller over his last nine starts in the last year plus. We've been picking him apart with righties, but ever since he came up, really. Um, 318 average, 378 Woban, a 168 ISO, 17% K rate, 10, 11% walk rate, 34% hard contact. No soft contact at all, sub 12% to both sides of the plate. That's pretty worrisome there. Even in a short dish sample, I mean, 170 hitters is still 170 hitters to either side 27 to lefties yeah whatever but um so the royals are, they're going to platoon a good bit against him here bobby witt eddie Oliveris. you can play Vinny still at 39 you can play him against pretty much everybody uh salvi has hit dinger three dingers in the last two games i believe or maybe the last three games uh 4300 still at a very playable price there mj probably going to lose his catcher eligibility now that they called up freddie Furman. um in any case, still has it today. Catcher and outfielder at 4,000. He hits lefties fine. Michael Garcia has had a couple of good days, uh, having just been called up as well. 2,400 dual eligibility. Matt Duffy has always hit lefties pretty well as well. Dual eligibility there. Very easy to stack this entire team because there's so many different combinations. So you can get different with it. And if you really like the Royals, and I think we do, attacking Kyle Muller here today, then... You can get different with it, and you can play Hunter Dozier down at the bottom of the lineup, who's 2,100. Um, would probably stay off of 
some of these lefties, like a JBJ who's terrible. Uh, but it, you know, he's 2,000. If you want to mix him in, if he's in the list, yeah, go ahead. So I think it's fine to be getting to the Royals. Obviously, we're going to prefer the the top end of the lineup here, but you're going to have to make some decisions to adjust for ownership, and that uh, that's going to include some of these cheaper guys like a Duffy, Garcia, Hunter, Dozier types. Keller on the mound, 6,600. Like, he's got an 18% walk rate this season. 18. He cannot throw strikes. He cannot find the strike zone, and I'm not going near that. Um, now, sure, that that's a very high number that is very likely to regress, but Keller has always had a, a sneaky high walk rate. This is These are aggregate numbers and dragged up quite a bit by the super bad numbers this year, but it, it's always been north of 9% or so. This season, however, it's double that, and he's still pitching to a lot of contact. When he does throw strikes, it's still just over the middle of the freaking plate, and he's been picked apart pretty good a couple of times. Now, he's still not giving up homers. Keller has really never given up a lot of homers. It's it's So if you want to attack Brad Keller and attack this very high walk rate and super low strike one rate, then I think we can go after him with full stacks and probably full stacks only because he just doesn't give up balls over the wall and never really has. Get to some Mysterio Ruiz up at the top. He's been excellent. He's got speed. He's got pop. 3,100, that's fine. Brent Rooker, of course, has pop. Ramon Laureano has pop as well. Excuse me. At 3,600, that's a fine play. J.J. Blade hit a bomb yesterday. We talked about him a little bit yesterday on the podcast or on the uh, in the vid. Um 2,000 for him, still the stone men. Shea has plenty of pop behind the plate. So you can play some guys that have pop really from both sides of the plate. Jace Peterson, 2,500 as well. So you can play some A stacks, and these this is one of the stacks that can get you there. You can game stack here for sure. Uh, the A's can get you to two expensive pitchers on the mound, which uh, you might want to do because it's kind of gross here in the lower range. Um, all that spiel aside, 6,600, we have seen Brad Keller pop at this price tag before, and this is still Oakland, and they're still bad. Still an 84 WRC plus against righties. Still a 26% K rate against righties. And a 286 Woba with a 132 ISO. Not hitting for any hard contact. Popping up a lot of balls. 12% infield fly ball infield fly ball rate is pretty high. Uh, a lot of soft contact here, 18%. That's kind of worrisome as a team aggregate. And we can still attack them. So if you want to go after them with, if you land in a couple Brad Keller teams, I think there is exploitability in a 1% ownership figure. It's not like hugely exploitable. You know, I don't want to get 10% of Brad Keller, but if you get 5 to 6, 5 to 8% or something like that of Brad Keller, just because you land on them at, at 6,600, it's probably not the worst play because this is still Oakland. I would still side with offense almost exclusively in this game, but getting to a couple of Brad Keller pieces is probably not the worst. It's p- probably pretty close, but, you know, I've made worse plays for sure. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and the Cardinals. 6,100 for Matt Boyd. I love this price for Matt Boyd. I hate this matchup, so I don't think we can do this either. He's got a high walk rate, too. Um, that It's super frustrating. There's nothing more frustrating in baseball than pitchers that just don't throw the damn baseball over the plate, you know, uh, everybody's so scared of getting hit so hard, which, yeah, sure, but, like, don't put people on base for free, it makes it that much worse, in any case, 11, 12% walk rate for Matt Boyd here over his last uh, 38 innings, of course, he's been a little bit better since he's been back in the rotation, strikeout stuff has come back a little bit as well, um, Maybe, like, he's had a couple of pretty tough outings here. Boston, Cleveland, Baltimore. He picked apart Milwaukee, but Milwaukee is terrible. Uh, He's had Houston once as well. So the strikeout stuff is still there in good matchups. This is not a good matchup. The Cardinals are a bad team. They lost another big one yesterday. But it's, as we talked about yesterday, it's not because of their offense. Their offense still, look, 280 average against lefties, 240 PAs, whatever, 100. 117 WRC plus here with a 23% K rate. This is all fine. 38, 39% hard contact against lefties. The hard contact is there against both sides. So it's not the offense. Like they put up eight or 10 runs or whatever they did yesterday. Right. And we, and we talked about stacking the Cardinals because they're, they're due for a bounce and their, and their offense is still performing. It's just the pitching staff that has been the problem for them. So, 
Jordan Montgomery, I think, should be able to solidify that a little bit here today against the Tigers. Tigers are the Tigers. And even though they just swept the Mets, uh, this is still the Tigers. 28% aggregate strikeout rate for them on on the season. However, sneaky 98 WRC+, plus, 37% hard contact for them as well. 220 PAs. Yeah, it's a short sample here also. This is still the Tigers. They're still going to hit a lot of ground balls, and they're very undisciplined at the plate. However, when they are making contact, it's it's pretty hard contact and decent contact on a line. So it's not horrible here. Like, the Tigers are a little bit better so far against lefties than they have been in the past couple of seasons. So not going to hit for a lot of power still, but attackable in the strikeout department, definitely. Um, unfortunately for Jordan Montgomery, the Tigers are probably going to platoon, I would say, eight left or eight righties against him today and in terms of raw strikeout stuff that's definitely the weaker side of his split 20 percent flat for him in the strikeout department against righties 161 iso a little bit more susceptible there with no soft contact sub 14 percent here um on the line a little bit at, at north of 20 percent to both sides of the plate 8600 i think this is a fine price tag for him i think he has upside to pop through a 12.5% ownership figure and pop for 25 or 30 in this particular matchup because they do still strike out a lot. But he could get picked apart a little, and and the Tigers could make this a, a little bit difficult on him. Buck 40 ground ball to fly ball over here with a 30% hard contact rate. Nothing terribly worrisome or anything against righties. But the Tigers, like we said, you know they're a little bit better this year. And, I mean, Javi Baez hit a, hit a homer yesterday, I mean, somehow. Um, I know it's against kind of a, you know, debuting Verlander, if you will. But uh, still, Matt Veerling, 2500 he makes it cheap. If you want to get to a Tigers stack, it's an off-the-board tournament stack. And there's a little bit of upside here for contact. And each one of these guys has 15-point upside in this matchup. And that's fine, as we mentioned yesterday, in secondary stacks. Veerling, 25 he'll make that happen for you. Eric Haas behind the plate. Or in the outfield at 3,000 flat. Torque at 24. He strikes out eh, really only at about a 21-22% clip against lefties. Uh, it, it's fine. Not a great hitter just yet, but still approachable, I think. So maybe a three-man or a four-man if you want to throw in Baez there at 3,500. Uh, Zach Short, if you want to, down at the bottom of the lineup, if you want to round out a full five-man, he's the stone min. So you could do it. It's not all that probable. Probably just short stacks, I would say. And mostly just side with Montgomery here. I think at 8600 I think this is a fine price tag. And he's a decent tournament pivot. If Max Fried's going to come in at 40%, roll some of these shares over to Jordan Montgomery. He has upside to pop through this. And the projections are virtually the same within a point or so. Uh, and for pitchers in baseball, it's not really a, a huge difference. So give me mostly the Cardinals here. I don't want to play Matt Boyd. This is a bad matchup. I like their offense still. And they're still all at playable prices. Arenado down to 44 now. Yeah, like... You guys are playing him pretty much every day, I think. Wilson Contreras, 43. Goldschmidt down to 53. That's much, much better today. 38 for Tommy Edmond at the top. That's fine and playable. 35 for Tyler O'Neill. Paul DeYoung's been good so far against lefties. 27 for him. All playable from the right side over here if you want to go after uh, a little bit of Matt Boyd. Um, and still attack this high walk rate. If he's going to be walking people, you can attack that. Okay, uh, Texas and the Angels. Dane Dunning, it's likely going to be Dane Dunning on the mound. He's probably just going to be a long relief type of arm here today, about four innings or so. Um, he's taking the, spot, the rotation spot of DeGrom because uh, Rip DeGrom, I, I, I guess. Um, nothing too impressive here in, in the arsenal for Dane Dunning. He's mostly a sinker, cutter, slider kind of guy. He throws a lot of a changeup. It's not really good, though. That's mostly because he's throwing a sinker, which is not a good pitch, as we talk about all the time. Uh, certainly to opposite-handed hitters, that's Shohei territory. That's Luis Renjifo, Jake Lamb, I, I mean, I guess, but no thank you. Um, probably not going to be Matt Theis in the lineup today. Maybe if they want to play him at first base uh, or DH him or something. Uh, they'll probably DH you, Tony, I would guess, actually. Um, so maybe not Matt Theis since he caught yesterday, but probably Chad Wallach behind the plate. So not many lefties that they can really go after this bad sinker 
width and, and bad change, right? Um, but the, the slider is really not very good either, and that's why there's no K stuff, right? He just doesn't have a width pitch against either side of the plate, no change, no slider. So um, cutter is going to help him induce a little bit of soft contact to same-handed hitters. That's why we see it pop to about 17% against righties here. But he still gives up a lot of hard contact. It tails back over the middle of the plate a lot of the time, does the cutter for Dane, and it's 37% hard on the barrel to righties. And he's attackable in the average. They'll hit for some average. They'll hit for a little bit of power. So you can get to some angels here once again. Not my favorite, kind of down the list, I would say, um, because this is probably going to be a bullpen game, and the angels are overall pretty bad. I mean, we did stack against them again yesterday. Finally, Jack Flaherty blew up. But overall, they're still, you know, it's just a an okay offense, uh, slightly north of break even. 107 WRC plus is fine. 23% K rate still to, to right-handers. Dunning's not going to strike him out with all that much regularity. 251 average, about average, I suppose. 167 ISO, about average there as well. Some hard contact, though, at 33%. So you could play some angel stacks if you want to go after Dane Dunning and a lower strikeout rate. I think that's okay. Trout should be back today, 6,200 for him. Zach Neto at the top, they're just going to let him run. Um, Otani at 65, this is fine. Anthony Rendon hasn't changed at 4,000. Hunter Renfro, I believe it was him that misplayed a ball terribly in the outfield that kind of led to the explosion uh, of Jack Flaherty yesterday, but... 4,900, good thing we don't have to play defensive metrics in DFS, huh? 49 for him in the middle of the lineup is fine. It's not great. Uh, Drury, Taylor Ward, he's been a little bit better. He's 3,900, so you could play him. Uh, I did mention Renhifo, still really like this at 29. So you can get to some Angel stacks down the down the list for sure uh, in bullpen games. Not all that excited, but um, preferring mostly offense here because I want, to, I want to attack Tyler Anderson a little bit as well. 6,000, I like the price. But I don't like the upside in the strikeout matchup uh, here against Texas. So give me Texas against lefties pretty much all season. We did it all of last year as well. Um, he throws strikes, but he's really only a three-pitch guy with a four-seamer cutter change. Doesn't have a, a wipeout breaking pitch to lefties. So that keeps his strikeout rate down against the left side of the plate too. He induces, however, a lot of soft contact. So he's a fly ball pitcher to righties at least, and with a lot of soft contact, that leads to fewer balls on the line and way more balls popped up. So it's kind of hard to stack against Tyler a lot of the time, but he has not been great this season, and uh, the whiff stuff just really is not there. He's been picked apart in pretty much every start outside of his last start when he got Milwaukee, who is terrible. Uh, six and two-thirds, seven inning, or seven Ks against Milwaukee, but before that, uh, he got Kansas City, Boston, Toronto, and Oakland. He was bad in each one of those starts. So, hey, I guess he was fine against Oakland. Um, yeah, it, it's it's okay. Price adjusted at 6000 I think it's it's fine to land on him if you get there, but I really don't want to go after Texas, man. 109 WRC plus for them. 24% aggregate K rate. Yeah, whatever, but he's not going to strike him out. 171 ISO, 328 WOBA. Not enough in the hard contact category to get super excited about, but they're still creating, hitting for some average, and hitting with runners in scoring position. Price-wise, I'm not jacked about going after semi in. Tyler Anderson's got an elite changeup, so he's going to be able to neutralize this power to the righties. Adelise Garcia, 57 as well, not stoked about that. Robbie Grossman will make it cheaper. Nate Lowe hits lefties fine. Josh Young I do like at 3,800. That's fine. So probably just one-off pieces, maybe some short stacks of the Rangers here. I do like attacking Tyler Anderson because you can go after when he's bad. Like, he just won't throw it by anybody. And if the changeup's bad, four-seamer that he's not spotting – then you know, there's a lot of variance that can come along with Tyler Anderson. But overall, I think price-wise, I'd, I'd have to side with Anderson here at 6000 um, but not going to go out of my way to be playing. It is a big median projection, however, at very low ownership so far for a guy down here at 6000 And that's something we have to keep a, keep in mind and, and note here at sub-7%. If you land on some of this, it's going to be kind of hard not to, I think, at, at this high a median projection. So uh, something to keep in mind while you're building teams. Okay, uh, Dodgers and the Padres. We have Kershaw on the mound and at 10-8, unfortunately. Um, I like Kershaw, and I'll probably, I'll probably end up getting to him. I like the ownership here. 
Um, and I like Darvish on the other side at 98 as well. I mean, these guys are basically equal uh, in terms of matchup, in terms of, I guess, Arsenal. Obviously, Darvish is throwing 42 pitches here, and Kershaw's just got the three. Um, but in terms of, you know, the matchup today and and price tag, and, and certainly with the median projections and the ownership figures, they're, it, all of those are equal. So, um, you know, if I had to choose, well, give me the guy that's 1,000 cheaper in Darvish. But I really don't want to be playing Darvish against Dodgers, to be quite honest. Uh, and I'm, I'm not overly thrilled with playing Kershaw against the Padres either. Really, you know, it, like, it's a bad matchup for for Kershaw in particular, just to, for the Padres against lefties, 20% strikeout rate, 109 WRC+. plus. But Kershaw's Kershaw, and he is still a top 10 arm in baseball when he is healthy. And he's healthy, and he looks fantastic. Every metric... For Kershaw, this is Pete Kershaw numbers. Um, you know, a little bit lower of a strikeout rate in kind of a noisy-ish sample in just 26 innings against lefties, 21% there, but like whatever. And he's still inducing north of 20% con- uh, soft contact, and everything's fine there. He's not getting beat up by righties or anything, so I think this is still fine. I'd prefer him to Wheeler, I think. Um, even though I like Wheeler a little bit as well. At 10 8, I'm not crazy about it, but it's, it's going to keep this ownership down. And we got so many other arms here. I think this is a fine tournament play here. Uh, he's one of the arms here, even against the Padres. He could pick apart this team, and he could pop for 30. So I think this is fine to mix in in tournaments. Uh, it's a high medium projection so far. So maybe a little, you know, fishy high against, pot, against the Padres in general, but, um, you know, this is Kershaw. This is not your everyday type of lefty against whom these Padre numbers versus lefties have, have been uh, accumulating. So I think it's fine to to get to some Kirsch. And really not my favorite, but getting a little bit of leverage, 12 15% of Kirsch, I think is probably okay. Same thing with Darvish. If you want to get a little bit of leverage here, the Dodgers have been striking out a lot. 24% K rate, 12% walk rate makes them very dangerous also. Uh, 235 ISO, 358 Woba, 35 percent hard contact rate. This is kind of why I would side with Kershaw a little bit more because the hard contact rate for the Dodgers against righties is still at 35 percent. However, the the hard contact rate for the Padres against lefties is at 25 percent. So um, even though both teams are dangerous and creating, and they they all got a lot of really good hitters, it's still it's still contact numbers that we have to get um, that are really kind of the tiebreakers for me. So I'd side, even though he is a thousand dollars more expensive, I'd probably side with Kershaw if I had to choose between the two, but good news for us, we don't really have to choose between the two. So I'd like to kind of play both of them in tournaments at the same ownership and the same medium projection. And both of these numbers, uh, the ownership numbers that it are below 10%. So yeah, give me some for sure. Um, I like Darvish and I like Kershaw. In general, the the fundamentals are nothing wrong with them. Darvish got he was actually pretty good in that Mexico City start. Uh, survived a, a lot longer than one would assume. So he's good and and Kershaw's good. Both of them look fine and healthy and stretched out and then no problems here. So no offense really for me in this game. Um, maybe if you want to do it on the late slate, okay, but uh, mostly pitching. Okay, Washington and Arizona. Um, Jojo Gray, I think we might be able to play here today. He's made some changes in the arsenal. Uh, he's throwing this four-seamer less. He's throwing more of a cutter. Now, it's not really reflected here in the sheet because you've got um, some numbers that are coming in pretty noisy, different uh, different systems, uh, sports info solutions, and and pitch info. And Statcast, they all judge this slider cutter pitch that he's throwing a little bit differently. Some gauge it as a slider, some as a cutter, um, and it, it, so we're getting some noise. So it's not reflected here in the sheet, but it is a cutter. And he has migrated about ten or so percent of his usage of this four seamer over to the cutter. And he's, he's eking a lot of value out of the cutter and the slider, and it's really increased his soft contact rates to the tune of about five ticks to either side. 
um, or to both sides, I, sh I should say. So we're, we're hovering at about 26, 27% soft contact. And those are elite figures. He's throwing a little bit less of the curveball, and he's not throwing this changeup anymore at all whatsoever. So this season, he's made the necessary adjustments in the arsenal to throw less of the bad pitch and more of the good pitch, right? And he added in the cutter. So that's what's allowed him to survive and induce so much soft contact so far this season. And at 6,400 here, I think we could play a couple of these teams he has 20 and 25 point upside. It's a tough matchup, definitely, uh, against Arizona. But I think we could play both sides here at 6,400. I'm probably going to have some JoJo. I'm not super thrilled about it because I'm also kind of waiting for a bit of a blow up. Um, but if he's not throwing the bad pitch nearly as much anymore and he's inducing a lot of soft contact here, I'm not as worried as maybe... Uh, I was yesterday about Flaherty, for example. Um, getting to Arizona, yeah, their aggregate numbers are really strong. 103 WRC plus and a 19% aggregate K rate. 170 ISO, 32% hard. It, these are all encouraging numbers. Buck 25, ground ball to fly ball. This is fine here. And against these aggregate numbers, yeah, we want to go after JoJo. But the hard contact numbers have tanked uh, against both sides of the plate and the soft as we mentioned, have skyrocketed. So very, very encouraging so far this season from JoJo. Um, the walks are still a little bit of an issue, and it's mostly to the left side still. High, high delta and still about a 12% walk rate to the lefties. So um, if he's going to put guys on base still and, and pitch to some contact, then yeah, that's a problem. But at 6,400, I think we'll probably have to include some JoJo in our teams. Um He's made the necessary changes, and this is what he's always had the strikeout upside. It's just putting it all together, and I think he's finally doing that. Nash, Nationals are making some pretty significant strides over here in their pitching staff. Um, price wise, I think I'd have to side with JoJo because overall, I'm just kind of lukewarm on the D backs' prices. I like Josh Rojas, his, his price is down to 4500 That's good. Still fine and playable. Cattell Marte, 54. Corbin Carroll, 53. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, but 45 for Christian Walker, not super jacked about that. And Lord S at 45, not super jacked about that. Make it a little bit cheaper with Dom Fletcher. That is uh, David Fletcher's brother. Uh, he just got called up for Arizona. He's a 2,500. That's fine. Gabby Moreno behind the plate, 35. Also fine. Alec Thomas has been okay as has Jerry Perdomo. He's been great, as a matter of fact, down at the bottom. So you can make some Arizona stacks happen. Probably see a little bit of ownership come on, come in on them. And I think that could be, if they steam, a, a decent spot to get some leverage with them and target some JoJo. There's more upside than 1.5% ownership on him. Even in this particular spot, the, the arsenal is different. So these numbers do not reflect uh, all the strides that he's made. This season, so I think we could probably play him, but I I'm gonna have some Arizona as well, just as like a, some coverage because if I just jump on the JoJo train and he gets blown apart, I'm gonna smash my head in the wall. Merrill Kelly on the other side, 6,800. I think you can play this too. This is a high median projection for him down here at this sub 7K range. Also very low ownership. He's gonna allow us to run deep into a game. He throws what five pitches here himself. And they're all good. So he suppresses. It's not so much in whiff stuff. It's location. It's sequencing. And it's dictating counts. He throws strikes. He doesn't walk people. And he stays off of the barrel. And that's really all we can ask for from anybody that doesn't have overwhelm overwhelming stuff. He has good chase in him north of 30% here. With a sub-10% swinging strike rate, a 26% CSW is actually very encouraging. So... All the suppression metrics are, are great for Merrill, and we talked about this in his last start against the Rockies at Coors. You can play him because he has some pre some suppression upside, and when nobody else plays him, that's a that makes him a really good tournament play. This is a high medium projection for him down here. So, um, you can yeah, do you want to play a couple of the Nats? Yeah, sure, because this ballpark is still going to allow guys to circle the bases a little bit, even though it kind of plays up pitching a little bit more. Um, since the humidor introduction, but the Nats here, they're, they're not going to hit for power, unfortunately. Still just, you know, a sub-10% ISO, that's no good. No hard contact, so many ground balls. 
they're very similar to Cleveland, uh, as we're going to mention every day. 73 WRC plus here and a 19% K rate. So you can get to them because they're going to swing and, and make some contact, and Merrill's not going to throw it past them. But this is a good suppression spot for Merrill. I would prefer getting to him, and I would almost prefer mostly pitching in this game despite a very high total for the D-backs here in the early going and what's likely to be some very high ownership on them. I think I would side in the early going here uh, with some pitching. I like these price tags a little bit better. And it, it, I really don't like playing Washington. I think they're they're terrible. You can get to them because they they pop as as value plays because they're all so so cheap. Every single one of them is 3K or less. So you can do that, and they're one of the stacks that could get you there. Merrill isn't totally immune to getting blown up. But this is a very good Arsenal. This is a bad team. So give me Merrill Kelly at a reduced price tag and no ownership, as opposed to the Nationals. He has more collective upside, I think, than the Nats do themselves. Uh, in terms of raw power. So mostly pitching here, I think. Some D, some D-backs, definitely, but I, I like JoJo a little bit. Okay, Christian Javier on the mound, 9,700 for him. Um, high medium projection and medium type of ownership. So far, I'm okay with Christian Javier. He's made some changes a little bit in the arsenal as well, inducing more soft contact, which is good. The hard contact number has come down a little bit. And he's throwing more strike one, which is very encouraging. However, he's sacrificing some strike, some raw strikeout rate a little bit here. The swinging strike stuff has dropped off a little, just a couple of ticks here or there. Nothing terribly worrisome, but throwing more strikes, and that's good. And, that, and you know, he's commensurately pitching to a little bit more contact. It's up to about 75% this season, which is still a very good number. However, the strikeout stuff is down to about 25%. So we're we're talking, you know, a, a good six ticks here, and they, you know that's nothing to shake a stick at, right? At at 9,700, you still need a lot of upside. 25%, 26% is still good, and still plenty playable, given that he's throwing more strikes and getting into more equitable counts. He's not throwing this change up nearly uh, pretty much at all anymore. It's mostly just the the four seamer slider, similar to JoJo, has is starting to remove the bad pitches a little bit and throw more of his good stuff. So that's that's excellent. That's what we want to see. Um, so the aggregate numbers here are going to suggest that we just play a lot of right-handers against him, but he's inducing more soft contact this season to the righties than he has in the past. And throwing more strikes, that, that makes him much more playable because he's still a, a very heavy ground ball to fly ball guy. Um, or I suppose a fly ball to ground ball guy at an 050 in aggregate. So super hard to stack against. If you want to target like a a, a one-off homer piece of Julio or or something like that, a Ty France maybe, yeah, okay. Um, Tay Oscar, it's not the worst, but these guys are going to strike out a lot in this matchup. So I almost definitely decide with Javier here. He's another one of these guys up in the upper range that we can target on the mound and get some shares of. I think uh, at 15% ownership, this seems about fine and probably where I would land if I built teams like right at the moment. Um, so we'll have to see how it fleshes out throughout the rest of the day, but I think this is a, a fine play also. On the mound for the Mariners, 10,000 for them, or for uh, Luis Castillo. And I like this a lot. Um, one thing that he is doing much less of this year as well is throwing the changeup far less. He dropped this down to about uh, 14 and 15 percent usage uh, rather than a full 20 percent because it was a bad pitch and he, he moved it all over the four seamer and and the and the two seamer a little bit um, and that's exactly what we want to see we want to see I, I absolutely love it when pitchers throw their good stuff and do not throw their bad stuff and that's what we're seeing here with Luis Castillo as well. So at 10000 I think this is a fine and playable price tag. Seeing a little bit higher ownership on him, mostly because the projection is so high, but the projection is so high because the arsenal is better this year. So strikeouts are up. Uh, strike one rate is up. Contact rate is down. Strikeout rate is up. Uh, everything Swinging strike rate is up to nearly 14% this season. Hard contact rates are down because he's throwing less of a bad changeup. I mean, everything is great for Luis Castillo, and I generally kind of balk a little bit with him about paying such an expensive price tag, but this is very playable 
um, given that he is adjusting the arsenal, and it's it's mostly a four-seamer, sinker, slider mix anymore, and not throwing a bad change. So, yeah, give me some Luis Castillo as well. I'll probably come in about with the field here. I don't want to get too crazy with this against a bad team still, because he's still giving up a lot of hard contact to the right side in particular, and his homer to fly ball rate... It, uh, specifically this season, is down at 3%. So that his career averages are about 15%. So that's going to regress, definitely. And if it's going to come, it's going to come against right-handers. He'll still be susceptible a little bit because he's throwing the changeup still a tiny, uh, a, a tiny portion uh, to the lefties. So Jordan and Kyle Tucker, yeah, sure. But I'm not wild about going after Kyle Tucker here at 58. I'd much rather just play Jordan at 6K. You want to play some righties? Okay, uh, I'd rather play Alex Bregman. Probably the only guy. Not stoked about 4,700 Jeremy Payne. I'd rather play a, a Corey Jokes down at 29, or even a Jake Myers at 22, if I were to get to get to some righties here. But uh, you can attack with Lu Luis Castillo on the mound because Houston has been attackable uh, really all season. 23.5% K rate, 114 ISO with a sub 30% hard contact rate against righties. So. Yeah, give me some Castillo on the mound, definitely. I like the Arsenal change. I'm not super crazy about the price tag, but there's about three or four guys that you could play above 10K today, and I think that's perfectly fine. Um, probably not a lot of the Mariners, I don't think, and maybe some short stacks if you want to go after Javier, but uh, not super thrilled about that. Okay, last game of the day here, Corbin Burns, 9,300. I like the price tag a lot here, and the market kind of agrees. High medium projection for him. So we got another one of these arms up here that... Uh, that we're probably going to want to get some shares of. Probably just with the field here, I think he's at kind of a dangerous spot. Uh, but the cutter is elite. This is probably the best cutter for a starting pitcher in baseball. And and the curveball slider mix is really good too. Changeup is okay. It's serviceable. Um, but since he's not throwing the four-seamer or the sinker and it's mostly the slider, the changeup is just kind of going to be marginal uh, most often here. So, um the K stuff is good, and really the only thing we got to worry about with Corbin Burns is kind of going deep enough into games a lot of the time. When he gets into a, a nice groove, that's not terribly worrisome. Uh, we know that he has seven and, and eight inning upside in him, but so far he's only had one outing of more than six innings this year, and that was eight full against Arizona. He's gone four and a third, five and a third, five and six, and five in his other outings. So, um, you know, the K stuff is leaving a little bit on the table there this season. Hasn't quite shown up just yet. It did pop to a full K in inning in that Arizona start, which is very encouraging. But he's slightly less than that uh, in in aggregate this year. Um, but not like that, like I said, not like it's terribly worrisome. This is a very playable price tag here. Uh, I would prefer if he were at about a quarter of this ownership so we could just smash it. But uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to come in probably at about the field because we like a lot of the other guys too. So uh, we'll see how it fleshes out over the rest of the day. But he'll probably, because of this medium projection, if this doesn't change, he's going to pop uh, really hard. And at, at 9,300, it's going to be hard to get guys like Christian Javier or anybody more expensive um, in this range or a U Darvish or anything like that. So um, it's, it's fine. It, the Giants over here, three true outcomes, of course, walk a lot, strike out a lot, hit for a lot of power. Hard contact is up 122 WRC plus against uh, righties this season and 775 PAs give or take. So um, Corbin Burns does have a little bit of volatility in him, and that's because of the strike one rate. He can elevate the pitch count a little bit and and get on the barrel a little bit to some same handed hitters here with uh, with the cutter when he just floats it back over the middle. He's a little susceptible with that marginal change up to lefties a little bit too. Um, you know, not terribly so. And he's got a huge ground ball to fly ball ratio against lefties. So we don't really want to go after him with a lot of lefties. But these guys are going to hit the baseball in the air, which will translate with their high high fly ball rates and his high ground ball rate to a lot of line drives. And it's north of 20% here, so a little bit uh, notable there for sure. But this is, I'm mostly going to side with Corbin Burns here, I think. If you want to get to a giant stack, they're at playable prices for sure. Lamont Wade, Jock Peterson, down to 4,000 now. It's a good, pretty good play, I think. Uh, Hanniger hits right, he's fine, 39. Conforto at 35, that's fine too. 
you want to round out a five man and throw in a Tyro, he's been he's been great. Fifty two hundred for him, not great. Uh, or a Blake Sable behind the plate, thirty two there. I think that's that's all playable if you want to get to some late states, late slate stacks uh, of the Giants against Burns because he'll probably be pretty popular there. Um, but not my favorite on the main slate. I think we could play him though. Probably not going to get two Giants on the main. Sean Manaya on the mound for them, fifty six hundred. Seeing about 10, 12% so far. I think this is fine. 56, I think it's, I mean, the pro- median projection here so far against the Brewers who have been awful. I've said that about 11 times today. Um, we can go after that. 5,600, this is a playable price. And if we need to get to a very cheap arm down here, uh, well, I'd certainly much rather play Manaya than Antonio Sensatella, for example, right? Um, the Brewers have just been dreadful. 66 WRC+. plus. They got picked apart at Coors Field by Kyle Freeland. Um, 31% K rate, 125 ISO. I don't want to play any of these guys, really. Yelich, no thank you. Uh, he's still hitting the ball hard, but not a lot of upside uh, left on left here. Willie Adamas is 5,500. He is one for or three for his last, like, 45 or something. He's been awful. Willie Contreras behind the plate is up to 51 now. Not totally sure why. Mikey Brosseau, he's probably the best price-adjusted play here at 3,600. I think that's okay. Brian Anderson, okay at 4,200. Third and outfield eligibility, Luke Voigt at 37. And kind of lukewarm there, so to speak. Uh, 2,600 for Tyrone Taylor. I, I like that play a little bit. Mostly known for his defense, but has some pop. So you can play some of these righties. Joey Weimer down at the bottom, yeah, sure. Uh, because Manaya still has a lot of variance in him, and when he's bad, he is really bad. He explodes to righties, um, you know, in a real, real big way. 358 Woba with a 273 average allowed and 239 ISO. These numbers are not coming down from Manaya, and he got he got pieced apart pretty good in um, in Mexico City, I believe. So we can still attack him with righties, 35% hard contact. And a lot of fly balls. So, yeah, go ahead if you want to attack some very short stacks or one-offs of the Brewers. But I'm not going to full stack them in San Francisco at 55 degrees because they're bad for the most part. Okay, so that's it for the breakdown. Long again, but a lot of games. Let's go through stacks quickly. Uh, Not really super interested in offense here. If anything, it would be Philly. Um... I don't really want to go after Zach Wheeler. Give me a little bit of Zach Wheeler. Maybe some Chris. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be hard not to land on him, do the strikeout rate, but kind of a bad spot, to be honest. Give me some of the Mets for sure against Senza Tella. Too much contact there for Senza and a lot of hard contact. Uh, Minnesota and Cleveland. Um, ugh, I hate playing Cleveland, but very little strikeout stuff against uh, lefties for Bailey Ober. Give me the Twins, though, against Battenfield. Kind of an off-the-board stack there. I like that. Uh, Baltimore and Atlanta. Atlanta, definitely. Baltimore is a head stack if... I mean, Freed's ownership here is, is getting kind of out of control, I think. Against a damn good lineup. Uh, I love Freed, and I, I will have a pretty good bit for sure, but uh, don't get me wrong. You can you can stack some Baltimore here and get some leverage. Oakland and KC, you can play offense and on both sides here. Maybe a couple of Brad Keller pieces, only if you land on them. There's exploitability in the ownership... But not all that much. Um, offense only. I, I kind of like Oakland here a little bit. Um, Detroit and, and St. Louis. Give me St. Louis again. Probably no Detroit. I do like Montgomery on the mound here a little bit. Uh, Texas and the Angels. Oof. Uh, Texas, sure. Short stacks maybe. Not stoked about the pricing. Angels, yeah, against Dane Dunning. You can target them, but they've been pretty bad um, outside of their performance yesterday, Dodgers and San Diego just pitching here, Kershaw and, and Darvish, not sure how much I'll get, but I, I like both of them, Washington and Arizona pitching almost exclusively here too. I'll, I'll have some D backs. Yeah. But I like Jojo a little bit. Uh, don't tell anybody I said this and I kind of like Merrill Kelly too. Um, Houston and Seattle, probably just, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably just Castillo on the mound. I think. Uh, I, I like some Javier. Give me some of that, sure. Uh, he's hard to stack against, which makes him very viable in tournaments. Um, so probably just pitching here, but Houston stacks if you want to attack some regression in the homer to fly ball rate against Luis Castillo. Milwaukee and San Francisco, only, you know, like very short stacks of Milwaukee, maybe a couple lefty one-offs at good prices like a Jock Peterson from the Giants or something, but mostly Corbin Burns there. So uh, that's it.
a uh, long one once again here today and keep an eye out for the projections we'll have a lot of updates as as friday rolls along and lineups roll in so good luck to everybody and we'll catch you guys tomorrow